gi. I'm a girl in a gi. In a gi. Holla. Where's my gi? Somebody Somebody get my gi? I like your gi. I am girls and gis. We're girls and gis. Girls and Geese presents the inaugural episode of the Girls and Geese podcast featuring our guest, two-time world champion and MMA veteran Emily Kwok of Princeton BJJ. In addition to four-time world champion and head Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor at Heinz Combat Sports, Dominica Obelanite. Our guests also include four-time Pan American champion and Australia's first female black belt, Sophia McDermott. Along with our host, the Girls and Geese program director, Shama Ko and Girls and Geese Colorado lead ambassador, Sharika Long O'Neill. Awesome. Here we are for the first Girls and Geese podcast. Sharika, can you believe we did it? We've been doing this for like two months, three months. How long has it been? Yeah, it, it's been a few months and it's been going at a snail's pace, but here we are and we're really excited about who we have on our first episode too. Absolutely. And I think the timing is perfect. I mean, look around. What we're all stuck at home, right? We got nothing better to do. (laughs) (laughs) So without further ado, uh, on our very first podcast, we have Emily Kwok. Hey, Emily. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. We have Dom Dom. Hey, Dom. How you doing? (laughs) (laughs) Dom Dom. Okay, I like that. (laughs) And we have Sophia McDermott. How are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me. No, oh, thank you so much for being on today. So for our very first podcast, Shrika and I were like, oh gosh, what can we do for the very first podcast? I have no idea. There's so much to talk about, right? Yeah. So we wanted to kind of go over like, what does it mean to live the jujitsu lifestyle? And in that, you know, for all of you, I think it means something different to all of us, right? Um, and it changes, it progresses, at least I know for me it has. So we wanted to kind of give you guys an opportunity to explain what does that mean to you is, do you consider yourself living the jujitsu lifestyle or is that just a fun term that everybody throws around? (laughs) Uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know how you guys feel, but it's, you know, the term jujitsu lifestyle, it's like, I'm so immersed in the whole culture that it is my life. Like there's no, there's, it just is it, if that makes sense. Um, And I don't personally know anything outside of it. Like for for me, the jujitsu and the health and fitness stuff, because that's been the whole way I've grown up from a gymnast and then jujitsu. Yeah. So is it more of a personal thing, the jujitsu lifestyle? Like we each define that separately and for ourselves? Probably. Yeah. Um, So it is my life. So in the sense that like you turn up to go to training and then the other things come off at like needing the gear and going to events, like it just sort of almost on autopilot from just training. Right. But I I can understand what you mean um, by watching one of my students at the UFC where she was this uh, quite overweight, very timid girl. And um, then all of a sudden, like she's dropped about 80 pounds um, trains as often as she can, she can, and um, is going to events like Girls in Geese and gone to some of my camps. And, and, and then I remember saying to her, whoa, you know, you're, you're in the jujitsu lifestyle. So I guess it's interesting as an outsider for me to see the evolution of other people, you know. I think it also means something different to you at different stages. And I would probably say for Dom and Sophia, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, they've been doing this for a long time. And when I first started jujitsu, the jujitsu lifestyle was, you know, imagining that I could go to Brazil one day and walk around in a gi and just train for five hours and go to the beach. Um, But much to what Sophia is saying, when you're practicing, if you're really dedicated to, to training and your own practice, you just start living it and it's no longer something you talk about because it's something that you do. And yeah. over the years, it, you know, I remember when I, when I first started dating my husband, Jerry, we would, um, we would be uh, going, I was working for Gracie magazine and we were at like the Pan Ams and I was at the table and all of these jujitsu stars would come over like Kira Gracie and uh, like I think Jean de Ribeiro and Cron Gracie. And my husband was a huge fan. And so every time somebody came, he'd be like, Oh my God, it's so-and-so. Oh my God. it's so-and-so. <laughs> And he would just be peeing his pants. And um, he's like, you don't know who these people are. And I was like, no, 
And he's like, you don't care? And I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, you know who I am? <laughs> Well, I mean, at the time I was like a, I think I was a purple belt, brown belt, but uh -huh. you know, it was just, um, I did, I, I don't mean this to sound the wrong way, but I didn't care because they just practiced the sport like I did. You know, like I just felt like, not that we were equals, but I was like, what's the big deal? We're all just practicing jujitsu. And so it was never, it, it started to become more of something I was immersed in and less of something that I imagined or, 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 you know, had big ideas about because it was just what it was. Mm -hmm. Now the jujitsu lifestyle, I think, you know, I don't, if I was a white belt now, I think I would think differently of it 20 years ago, but uh, the jujitsu lifestyle for me now is can you juggle a school and training and sometimes competition with being a mother, with having another <laughs> job, with having friends and drama? Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's what you guys said. Uh, I would say that um, the jujitsu lifestyle is very much like a personal kind of brand or something you personally identify with and turn into your own thing. For me, my jujitsu lifestyle has overarchingly been defined by evolution and kind of um, learning what kinds of new roles I'm supposed to play as the art develops and as I grow up within it, um, trying to understand when it's the correct time to be an athlete and a competitor, when it's the correct time to be a hobbyist, when it's the correct time to be a fangirl, when it's the correct time to be an instructor, and then just trying to balance out all those roles and see how they fit into my life and how they allow me to develop and grow as a person outside of jujitsu. But because my life has been so ingrained and entrenched into the sport, um, I see it as being kind of my world, um, at the same time being a part of my world and just kind of influencing my day-to-day -day decisions. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's awesome. Um, I guess that's, sorry, what I was trying to say at the start, it's like, um, Dominique is saying it, it, it is her world. And I think for all of us, it is our world. So sometimes it might be tough to actually look at, look at it from an outsider's perspective. Absolutely. That makes sense. Absolutely. I know all three of you are instructors and you guys have, you're also students. And so then the next t issue that we wanted to kind of tackle was loyalty. And, and what are your thoughts as far as loyalty? <laughs> <laughs> Loyalty's not real. It's like a made up term used by people in jujitsu to keep like toxic behavior unchecked. That's kind of, I'm going to throw this out there right away because a lot of people have been speaking out about it lately and like, no, you're supposed to stay loyal to the gym, your instructor, your training partners, whatever, whatever. Using loyalty as an excuse to tether people who are not supposed to be together, tethering instructors with students they don't deserve. Um, yeah. and being people uh, in really shitty situations in general. A hundred percent. And I'd go a step further to say that loyalty, that word is really the thing to try and control people. And a lot of the time, the female students in a really hardcore patriarchal system. And I think that that's what all of us, every single one of us here is um, that's that's really our point of difference to maybe some of, well, it, it, not point of difference, but it's kind of our mission to break that pa patriarchy down. Absolutely. I think it's- And it's, expose the bullshit. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's a really low level social, socialized behavior. Um, very reminiscent of maybe something you should have experienced when you, th when you were 13 or 14 years old, not when you're 34 or 45 or 55. Um, and, you know, the sadness of it is, I, I think uh, it, loyalty as a word can be a great thing. And when loyalty goes two ways, it's a beautiful thing, you know? So like um, when I think one of the most common examples we hear about loyalty being used is, okay, don't, don't train with these people or don't go with those people because they're not part of your team. Mm -hmm. um, they might steal you as a student or they might hurt you. And and in my eyes, I really feel like a true loyalty should be that if you trust me and I trust you and our loyalty is deep, it shouldn't matter where you go and it shouldn't matter what you do because we, we will continue to maintain the same level of respect for each other. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think that jujitsu is full, filled with uh, very evolved people. <laughs> <laughs> and as such, you know, just because you're an accomplished athlete and you own a school doesn't particularly make you um, a, a very, you know, evolved thinker or a leader. And we put these people in front of everyone and we say, listen to this person because 
they won 10 gold medals, therefore they know everything about life and it's totally wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, being a great black belt does not make you a gra- great black belt in life. You know, well, it outside does, that gym. Yeah, it doesn't so, make you a good person. Absolutely. It also doesn't make you a business leader, a business owner. It doesn't make you, you know, it, it just doesn't. If you're good at jiu-jitsu. Good at, yeah, if you're good at jujitsu, you're good at jujitsu. Good for you. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've experienced a lot of people in our jujitsu journey kind of together, seeing a lot of people that presented themselves as truly remarkable people on the mats, either as athletes or instructors or just in, the, in their movement, in their way of movement. But having a kind of high level thinking in that sense does not translate out into the real world. It doesn't translate out into being a good delegator or a good leader or a compassionate leader. And I think what she said about loyalty was really spot on. I think if you combine loyalty with a sense of freedom and give your students or whoever you're talking about when you're talking about this relationship of loyalty, if you give them the freedom to move around and make their own decisions and come to you with their concerns, then you'll be rewarded with like the gift of kind of mentorship or just like that interactivity. What about some red flags? So for a student who, say somebody who's maybe not been around in the jujitsu scene for long or maybe has and never experienced any kind of, you know, doesn't see it as we have, you know. Um, what do you- I would say look up- People should look for. Look up cult-like behavior. And there is a, there's usually like a, a list of things that come about. I mean, and it's, whether you're joining some sort of strange religious cult or you're, you're joining a religiously cultish gym, it's the same thing. It's controlling behavior. Anytime somebody tries to take your liberties away and your voice away in the name of their greater cause or hero worship or whatever it is, um, I think that's a huge red flag. I mean, just because you start jujitsu doesn't mean you should give up your voice. And if someone tries to take that voice away, I think that's a major, major reason of concern. And so I tell a lot of people today, if you don't know anything about jujitsu and you're looking to check out a gym, don't just go to one, go to three or four, feel the vibe, see how you get treated. Do they try to hard sell you on an agreement? Do they try to take the choice away from you to think freely about what you're doing there? If they do that, then you probably have some reason for some concern. And you, you, you get duped as a, as a grown adult making a six figure salary you will gladly sign the dotted line and not understand what you're signing up for. Mm-hmm. It's a dangerous thing. Yeah, definitely. I think the first, one of the first red flags is um, when your coach might um, like put some type of condition on you. Uh, that, that's how it starts, you know, um, and it, it's come my way so much. I can't even tell you um, of students coming to me saying, Oh, well, you know, my coach said I couldn't go to the girls in gear event. Do you, like, that, my coach said I couldn't go to Rowdy Rollers. Like, yeah. so it's, it starts off being, yeah. like, um, it's little by little. And actually, this is how sort of this pathological abusive behaviour comes in relationships. It's, it's all a form of control. I've seen it so much. Um, and just, you know, coaches in general... Um, basically controlling their students so they can't go to other gyms and can't go to other events or there's some type of condition attached to it. That's, that for me would be the biggest red flag. Like, oh, okay, that's not what I signed up for yet. Mm-hmm. I would agree with everything that's already been said. I would also add that, unfortunately, for a lot of people that are maybe not um, aware of what controlling behavior looks like, maybe they haven't experienced it in their lives and they're unable to see the patterns, it's going to be hard to see that in a, in a gym unless they've, well, unless they spend a lot of time in that gym, but even then, if they get entrenched into the culture of the gym, they might start to set aside certain things that are red flags as just being kind of circumstantial. I think something really interesting that uh, somebody decided to do that actually came to my gym before quarantine. Um, They came from a gym that I was familiar with. Their program was shutting down. They came as a whole squad to try out class. And after the class, two of the guys sat down with me and actually interviewed me as an instructor and kind of asked me some very interesting questions about how I got along with the owners, how I got along with the students, kind of what my plans as an instructor were. 
And I remember ending the conversation by saying, I don't think you should just exclusively evaluate me. I think you should really talk to the other students and see what they think about the vibe because it's usually the other students that will let you know what's going on. If it's like a cliquey environment, if it's a comfortable space, if the instructor is approachable, if you're gonna be taken care of, and if it's generally, if generally the environment is a pleasant one. Yeah. I agree. And also, I, I think it provides some level of transparency, too. Like, I want to know what my, my students are thinking about me. And if there's things I need to work on, well, I'm going to work on those things. Those are the kind of professors, coaches, whatever that I want to be under. And I, we also have to consider these people are paying for a service. So I'm like, this is paid for. You, you're not getting loyalty from me. You're getting a check every month. And so my issue with anyone who wants to talk about loyalty, you're not loyal already out the door is my feeling and I would walk out. So those are some red flags too. You want to start talking about loyalty. Well, I'm going to think that you have issues yourself. And I, I think we're, I mean, it's also, this is a very, I think that the freedom that we're all expressing of needing or wanting to see is, um, it's also very, it's like a Western notion to have this kind of freedom and ability. So, I mean, depending on the culture you come from, it could be very different. Mm -hmm. And I will say that I think the cross culture from, you know, the, all of this coming from Brazil, a, a lot of the older school systems and the houses, if you will, might have a lot more uh, of a conservative approach to what loyalty really means. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 you know, I said this on an interview, maybe like five, six years ago, as you see more and more black belts uh, graduating uh, who are sort of educated and brought up in sort of the American way, I think you're going to start to see some of this culture be pushed out because most people who come from an educated Western, you know, North American background will sort of say, I'm kind of not into this, you know, and, and I don't think it's as prevalent now as it used to be and less people are tolerant of it still slow and it still happens, but I think it's starting to change for sure. I 100% agree with you. Um, and that's, I think it's not just sort of uh, the, the traditional sense, but going back to what I was saying before, it's that patriarchal sense. Um, and I just think things need to be shaken up and changed. Um, when, when I was offered the job to teach, to run the program at the UFC gym here in Las Vegas, I kind of jumped at it because it was my opportunity as a female instructor in a really male dominated environment to come and like start ruffling feathers and changing things up. Right. Yeah. And to your point, Sophia, I think that's, that's really important to note that I don't actually have a woman's program in my school. Mm -hmm. I'm 50% owner and I'm 50% head instructor. And there's a real reason behind that. It's not that I don't support women. It's not that I don't love training with women and value those all female environments. But I think it, the new normal should be, it doesn't matter what gender you are. That to me is the new normal. And if a new woman walks in, most of the time I feel like women want to train with other women or have women's classes because they want to see someone like them. Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah. if I'm at the front of the room, I feel like that's cause enough to say to another woman, you belong here. And clearly everybody else does too. Absolutely. But I don't know if we're quite where yeah. you're at. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You're, you're like a couple of years ahead, I think. I think what needs to happen still is more women in in the lead, in the front, out front, yeah. teaching, doing all this stuff for then the new norm to switch back of literally it doesn't enter anyone's head whether that person is teach, teaching is a male or a female. Yeah. I actually I don't think, think we're the there end, yet. That's the end goal, right? I yeah. Mean, ultimately. I'm there, bitches. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. <laughs> let, let me hop in my time travel machine and I'll just meet you in the future. <laughs> well, this, Sophia, this goes back to your first point when we were talking about what is the jujitsu lifestyle and you were talking about living it. And I think this is purely, um, you know, this is where I'm at is that I'm choosing to define what my jujitsu yeah. lifestyle and my jujitsu journey is. And it yeah. doesn't include me standing at the back of the room anymore, you know? And if that means that I'm not you know, everybody's cup of tea. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but we've had our school open for 10 years and 
We have a, a very rich and deep pool of athletes that come to train with us, male and female, and I'm tremendously proud of all of them. And all the men that have come up through my ranks are like, yo, I'm here because of you, you know, yeah. and it's, it's a beautiful thing. But it, it was a choice that I made to not make that part of my narrative. Um, earlier yeah. on, I certainly had a women's program, but as I learned more about myself and as I learned more about what I thought the industry needed, it, you know, I was going to make that choice to take a stand on my own. And those are choices that we all have to make. So, you know, make it what you want it to be. Yep. Absolutely. Create your own reality. Yeah, so, to your also point about um, like dismantling the patriarchal aspect of this sport, being a female instructor that is opening herself up to teaching both men and women is a really great filter that is kind of built into the system because anybody that has an ego large enough or grandiose enough that they will see someone like me and they're like, oh no, a person with boobs i can't possibly learn from her <laughs> then they'll immediately kind of move away and not be interested um whereas like all the students that i have i know that they don't care i know that they respect me regardless of the gender that i was born with and um they'll learn from me regardless because what matters to them is the jujitsu and not any of the like attached kind of social Doctor. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, think I also want to be clear too, that um, I admire and I respect a lot of the men that taught me everything that I know. So it's, you know, I don't want uh, any man that might be listening to this podcast to think that um, I or we have an ill opinion of them. But uh, I, I do think that, you know, we're just asking for a seat at the same table and Absolutely. there's nothing wrong right. with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. So you guys, I think in this conversation, we kind of told, touched on the cult like mentalities um and i i think they are alive and well in our brazilian jiu-jitsu community i want to know what you guys' perspectives are and if you've experienced that firsthand yourselves too oh you gotta open up a can of worms oh, yeah. <laughs> that's what we're trying to do is this, is this part one of ten or <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna uh, be a two part for sure <laughs> uh, no i mean you know it's uh i think that when you've been in this for a long period of time and and you've sort of passionately taken up the cause i think it would be rare to sit, to find someone who hasn't dealt with some aspect of it um and i you know, whereas, and I used to look at my situation as uh, a, a place of a, a lot of pain and um, regret. I think in the last few years, I've come to really be thankful for some of the lessons I've learned because it's educated me to know better for myself and to also try to uh, teach other people to be, you know, um, aware of what's going on around them. And uh, cult like behavior, you know, that type of negativity doesn't have to come in the form of physical abuse. In my case, it came in, in the form of mental abuse and emotional abuse, where, um, you know, I was competing a lot. Uh, it's actually all I've been, it's all that, uh, it was all that I identified with for a long time. And um, when I was sort of at the peak and I had just won Mundials, uh, the team that I was with, I guess we had some personality differences. <laughs> Um, I, I, and, uh, I was, I was sort of at the, um, at the expense of my career and my own self-esteem, uh, members on my team, including the, uh, the wife of the head instructor decided that, uh, I should be sort of mentally degraded and spoken down towards and isolated, um, to the point where it, it kind of really knocked me off my horse and, I think when we notice most athletes today ascending and sort of getting to the top, you see them ride it out for a few years because they build momentum and in their career and in their performance. And uh, I got knocked off my horse very early on and it resulted in me going through quite a bit of depression and, and almost quitting jujitsu as a brown belt. So um, it was a, it was a pretty disgusting time in my life and I don't care to ever see that kind of behavior uh, appear in front of me ever again. So it's to me become a very personal cause to speak out whenever I do feel that people are being abused. Um, because I, I jujitsu should be a fun thing. We all come to it because we love it. We enjoy it. It's a positive part in our lives and for it to become a miserable place and for terrible things to happen to you as a person, uh, because of your love for it, uh, to me is just totally unacceptable. 
I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we share probably similar journeys. Um, and I think because we, you know, we started way back and competing at a time where it was mostly resilience. Um, well, you're, you're originally based in Canada, Emily, yeah? Mm -hmm. I came from Canada, but I, I moved to the U.S. when I was a purple belt, so. Okay. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that you didn't fit the mold. No. And neither did I. And what I dealt with from the very beginning um, was that I was this ultimate rogue, uh, gringo, and I did not fit the mold at all on any level. And there was a reason why, like, before the Worlds in 2006, I busted my butt to try and learn Portuguese. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if I... Um, if I couldn't relate to a lot of the Brazilian referees, they just outs me right away. And um, so I, I found like so much discrimination because I didn't fit. I wasn't part of the Gracies. I wasn't part of anything like that. I was just kind of Sophia, this rogue chick with a vision um, just to try and be the best at that are best that I could be, be the first Australian because de even dealing with that in Australia was hard. Um, and then coming to the United States was hard. So everywhere about me, I dealt with, um, what's the word? Uh, like push, pushback because it wasn't their vision. It was mine. And I was this rogue that was trying to do something that didn't fit people's visions of what jujitsu or a jujitsu competitor should be like. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was just hardcore of, um, sort of discrimination and then control. It, push pull my whole journey and so for me that's why I ended up sort of just isolating myself um, from everything but then choosing my own personal connections which was like a really strong one with you Shama with Girls and Gee because I I knew what your vision and your motive was and your mission I'm like yes <laughs> you know <laughs> you know so just um, yeah I, and I think that's why we all do what we do and, and I do what I do. And, and our experiences have um, allowed us to become very wise teachers um, and uh, because of all my experiences. And some of them are really horrible, like just so horrible and so controlling. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think that my mission is to help particularly women through this journey of jujitsu so that nothing like that of what I experienced yeah. th that won't ever happen to them. Yeah, um, Sophia, I completely kind of agree with your point. I think most of us women that have come up the ranks through the 2000s or maybe even earlier saw the jujitsu world as being completely washed with Brazilian men and not really having a voice in that crowd. Even in the more kind of developed even in gyms like here in New York um, and in New Jersey, which were, were my experiences. I have too many cult-like experiences to pull from, but I think the, the major ones were always unchecked, um, kind of brutish behavior, almost like fraternity-like behavior. Yep. There would be a group of people that were reinforcing each other's negative qualities and the instructor just happened to kind of turn the other way or maybe ignore it, not necessarily enforce it, but definitely ignore it because either it wasn't relevant to their way of living or maybe they wanted to kind of continue to support this group because they were outstanding competitors or they were just outstanding friends of the instructor. So the instructor's not like turning a blind eye to rogue behavior that was not conducive to, the, to a healthy environment within the school and affected a lot of students. One of them was me. And then also on the flip side, unstable instructors, instructors that seem like they are, they have your best interests in mind, but really they're manipulating what you're doing and using it for their own benefit, whether Thank it's you. to uplift a school, yeah, to uplift their name, to use your name, to gain <laughs> credibility. Um, and and I, think, I think one thing that I really wanna highlight is through my years of going through these experiences and having to leave, um, pretty large gyms and then having to explain myself, I really had to take a look back and check in with myself about why I was choosing instructors that weren't necessarily helpful to me, or not necessarily caring about me. And myself as a student, I was always looking for somebody to fulfill this role of like being a coach, mentor, role model that was a male figure. Um, and they would always come up short because 
at the end yeah. of the day, they would see me and they wouldn't relate. There'd be a disconnect. They'd want their male students to be uplifted. They wouldn't necessarily pay attention to me, or they'd see what I was doing and be like, oh, that's nice. I'm glad that she's like bringing something to the school, but like, Good job, little girl. Like, oh, now, now let's talk about the men in the room. Um, so condescending. Yeah, but I think for me, it, uh, I had to kind of check in about where my self-respect was at that moment because I was really looking for validation from people that weren't fitting the mold of a good mentor. Yeah, I think, wow. I think to go along with that, it's, um, I don't think a lot of men, and this isn't making an excuse, but like, I think for those of us that are kind of in a black belt capacity at this point, we came from a time and a generation where there weren't a lot of women congregating, right? So whether you were talking about a woman's program, girls and geese, jujitsu camps, there were very few women around period. So I have a theory that those of us that are kind of of this generation are slightly batshit crazy because <laughs> <laughs> we put up with things that normal people would not want to put up with. Yeah. Right? And honestly, like our, our level of tolerance, uh, I think is a lot higher than what it would be for the average person because we are slightly crazy and stubborn and passionate about what we do. And thank God we are, because now you have like a, a, a group of women that are now at the top that are sort of advocating for everybody else and making jujitsu a much more inclusive space because we weren't included for so long. And I think for a lot of my instructors and people I've come across in the past, um, I feel like sometimes they just didn't know what to do with us. So it was easier to just put us in the corner of the room. And I'm not gonna, def like, I'm not gonna say that it was okay to do that, but I think to be fair, like there was probably some fear about what am I, how am I supposed to train you? What am I, you know? The opposite thing that happened too was sometimes uh, I would just be included as one of the dudes. So I would be invited into all the locker room chats. I would hear about how many blue belt girls they were banging, you know, like it, you would <laughs> all that stuff. And in some ways it was a weird compliment because it was like, Oh, that's Emily. She's one of us. Don't worry about her. Yeah. You know? Um, but that, you know, it's, it, there's yeah. so many evolutions of this that have, that have, that have, that have happened. But those of us that are still standing, I think are slightly not right in the head, but <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm using that quote for the sound bite. <laughs> that is so great. Do you think um, that good leaders oh. tend to not have a cult-like environment? Does it, is there a correlation I between do. the quality of leadership or does it also go back to students or coaches? I, uh, I think things are shifting. Okay. And I think that it's because of women like us. So going to like kind of more of a, I don't know, like a bigger perspective on overall life. I think that there's been a shift. Shama and I can crack on about this forever, but there's like a big collective energetic shift. And um, with that, um, there's been like a push of more feminine energy um, and it's still coming in. It needs to come in. <clears throat> but with these changes of more feminine energy coming in, um, the idea of leadership is also changing. And it's no longer this dictatorial idea, cult thing, that's not working anymore. And it's because people collectively have more just freedom. People aren't tolerating it. So um, with that, um, leadership is more about the person um, not just, you know, telling people what to do from some comfy chair. It's being out in the front line and leading by example, completely 100%. And I think the other thing is it's about more connection, which is why um, women these days want a leader as a female in jujitsu because they can relate to that. They can't relate to like some old guy. I'm just using that as a, an example that's way beyond what maybe a 20 year old female might be needing as a leader for the sport. Do you know what I mean? So it's all changing. The whole concept of leadership is changing. And the beautiful thing of that is it's opening space for more females to come in and take that leadership role. Okay. But so do you, if, if they're a good leader, are we thinking that, a cult-like environment does not exist in that dojo or academy? Or can it still yeah. exist? Yeah. I don't think um, good leaders have a, like a, a cult 
mentality. I think a good leader has more of a tribe um, based on just a collective, uh, uh, like a collective, um, how do I say, in syncness. <laughs> I don't know if that word exists, but um, we're all in sync with each other and we're all connected with each other. I think it's less about um, imposing controls and restrictions on people. I think good leadership is something that people should naturally gravitate towards and opt in to be a part of, but there's no restrictions or measures placed on their involvement. Whereas in yes. a more, more cult-like environment, um, there's conditions always yes. attached to the cause. Um, and I, and you know, for me, I, I truly try to build my gym in the light of this is everything that I wish I had when I grew up. That's so, awesome. you know, the, the thing, a lot of the things that I just didn't have, I didn't have coaches that would come coach me. I didn't have instructors that wanted to help me. I didn't have teammates that would stand by me and, and, you know, um, be in solidarity with me. So, uh, a lot of what I try to do at my gym is to make it a much more inclusive environment than I ever had. Uh, you know, I was, I was kind of trying to fit in to things that I didn't really fit into. Um, and I, I think that now we are seeing that there are ways to, to be more, um, to broaden our scope and to be more inclusive of all the different types of people and all the different types of needs that people have when they come to jujitsu. That's fair. That's fair. I think earlier when we were discussing loyalty, we kind of touched on maybe sexism a little bit. It happened. You find more women are teaching women's classes because that's just what we're qualified to do. Um, does it occur? Yes. Do you guys have experiences, personal experiences where some male maybe didn't want to learn anything from you? Also, I've seen some females also don't want to learn from other females too. So I'd like to hear your perspective on that too. Oh, that's a, that's a dirty bucket, dude. Dirty. <laughs> We're dropping it. <laughs> You know, it's uh, definitely there's always like, so I think, again, it kind of goes back to what we're accustomed to and introducing something that's a little bit different. There's definitely men that I've seen look at you sideways there because they think, what on earth can you teach me? But I've also seen on the opposite end, I have this great um, dude up in Michigan, Dan Cousino, who's, I've been out to his school multiple times. And Dan is like a former, like, strongman bodybuilder he must be like 300 pounds of like solid rock and all of his students are are like dudes like great blue collar dudes but they love <laughs> having me out because they're like if this works for you it's got to work for guys like us and um you know there's always going to be doubters and there's always going to be haters and there's always going to be people that will say what you have is of no value to me but that culture is changing as there's better examples being set because there's more people willing to step to the front. So I think a lot of that involves women like us or other women stepping up and saying, I'm okay being made an example of, I'm gonna take a stand because this is a new normal that I'd like to set. And then it also means that the men in the room have to stand behind us and say, I value this person and this is what matters to me in my gym, you know? Um, the other ball of wax you're talking about, girls and not wanting to train with girls or support girls, I see that a lot. And look, I think women are very emotional creatures. <laughs> and I think also a lot of what men have to do in, uh, as a whole in the culture, there's still a lot of space. And so you see a lot of people that I think are looking for their own leadership opportunities and they kind of want to congregate and do their own thing. And, may, and maybe that's fair. But in the end, you know, we're all going to work it out. We all work it out on the mat. Um, I remember having this interesting conversation once with somebody about the fact that, you know, men can't, men can't kind of like find their own path or escape other men because there's just so many men. Mm -hmm. So you're forced to work it out. But mm -hmm. if you go to a gym and there's a female instructor and let's say like 20 women and only 10 of them like to go to her class because the other 10 don't want to go or they want to be catty or do their own thing there's no room for that when there's another hundred women, you know, you just have to work it out. So, um, so hopefully that problem will go away in time because no matter how approachable and friendly you might try to be, um, people want to go their own way. And, you know, I don't think it's our, I don't think it's my job to necessarily try to change their mind. I, I'll just keep on, keep on living my life and I'll associate with people like this. So. <laughs> I completely agree with that whole last bit. I also think it kind of, 
the theme of this conversation seems to be that while there are um, really negative things happening within the community at all times, there is a progressive shift moving forward. And I think um, when we're talking about sex experience as female instructors, either from male counterparts or male students or even female students, um, we should also think about like intention. Uh, a lot of people that I know that have come to learn from me versus to learn from a man, there's something that I'm providing that they're not providing, um, which I hope is technique. I hope that at the end of the day, they're here to learn from me because I offer good technique, like I offer good instruction. Um, but sometimes people come, Emily said it before, we're all a little fucked. We're all a little crazy. Um, people come to this sport for crazy reasons. It can be to heal trauma. It can be to like find a role model that looks like their dad or their mom. And for, because for a lot of guys, like they want, a male leader on top because that's kind of who they want to aspire to turn into so that's yeah. kind of like something that they have on the back burner that maybe they're not thinking about and that's maybe why we won't necessarily conjure up a lot of um equality in, in terms of our student base uh, and what they look like um but i think overall we should really be celebrating the fact that there are people out there that are starting to cast aside any other attachments and really are just looking at the pure quality of instruction and the pure kind of environment that we can set up for them to exist within. And that is really, that's a beautiful thing to me. Like I would, I love that people would come to me and learn from me, not because I'm a woman, but because I'm just a capable instructor mm -hmm. and I know what I'm talking about. Um, and I feel like I've kind of had so many um, experiences with um, men who say things as Emily said before, like you have to learn from her. She's smaller than you. she knows what she's talking about. She knows what she's doing. And I had a really wonderful instance of uh, going to my home country, Lithuania, one of the most sexist uh, countries in Europe and sitting down with a whole bunch of guys from an MMA school after teaching them like a small class and having the leader of the gym tell everyone to quiet down and he was like, I don't understand why there's all this sexism in jiu-jitsu. And I'm like, okay, go off. Like, tell me more. I want to hear about this. And he is like, he's like, look at you. He's like, you're so much smaller than me. And you kick my ass. He's like, and you still have to train with me. I'm so much bigger than you. I should be able to smash you into the ground. And I can't. He's like, look at her. She knows what she's talking about. <laughs> and it just warmed my heart that somebody like that who has been socialized to think a certain way, has been socialized to think of me as somebody that's biologically weaker, even emotionally weaker than them and should be cast aside because I don't know what I'm talking about, made a platform for me and even uplifted me as a potential instructor and leader of this group of like really giant, hairy Eastern European men. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanna add that um, I don't think, um, so traditionally in jujitsu, I think we feel like leadership and instruction sort of uh, just is based on how, how much we can beat the shit out of the people that are training with us. And I have to say that my notion of leadership is very different in that I'm not ever going to be the biggest person in the room and I'm only getting older and weaker and more compromised and, um, there are students, you know, if a 250 pound white belt walks into my school, that might be dangerous for me to train with off the bat. So, I mean, I have to watch what training and leadership on the mats means to me. Mm -hmm. And um, to Dominica's point, you know, about like, I hope that they, they think that I'm a good technical instructor. There is that as well. But I think also as we grow and as we age, I don't think it's uh, possible for those of us who are in a teaching capacity to become experts at every single type of guard and every type of evolution of jujitsu that there is. And as leaders, we can tap into better resources. And I think as good leaders, we have the ability to not only teach what we know, but to also point and guide students in the direction of places that they can go to enrich their path as well. And so I, I just want to raise that that's, that's something that I think maybe some of us as females may come to that realization a little bit faster maybe because of our, our strength differences or our size differences. Um, but, you know, leadership just the same. I had a very touching conversation with a student the other day who, um, who we might have to say goodbye to. And I, I never expected this to come out of his mouth because he could 
hand me my ass on a plate 20 times over. But he said, uh, the first experience I had coming to your school um, was, I think he was a purple belt, blue belt or a purple belt. And he said, the first experience I had coming to your school was rolling with a five month pregnant Emily. And he's like, and I thought to myself, if someone like this is going to roll with me, that proves how much this person is dedicated to learning jujitsu. And this is a place that I want to train. I was wow. shocked that he said this because awesome. this is a young 20 something man who is very, very accomplished at what he does and trains really, really hard. And it brought me to tears because, you know, in reverse, I think, oh, I'm, I'm slightly compromised because I'm a little Oompa Loompa right now. And this person probably won't want to stay and train with us because the head instructor is a woman who's now getting larger and bigger and, and less coordinated. And um, I thought that was a really beautiful thing. So I think so much of this is about us learning to set a better example, a different example. Right. Well, and, and hats off to those progressive men too. Mm -hmm. um, the progressive thinking men who basically, you know, can sort of look outside themselves and see the circumstance for what it is. A woman who's five months pregnant and still on the mat training, that's phenomenal, right? So, yeah, I, I agree with all, all of this. I think it's amazing. Um, I think leadership is m so much more than just about, you know, being able to kick every student's butts. Um, and like uh, Emily, you were saying, you know, uh, as you get older, and for me, kids have really changed my energy. Like, <laughs> raising two kids on my own is hard. And I don't stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... You know, I'm tired and I sometimes I just don't want to roll. I don't, I, but, but I will do a great job teaching and I will give my students, you know, that, that emotional aspect that they're needing. Um, and I think whether you feel like that you can kick everyone's butt or not is, is irrelevant as things progress because it's all about attitude. And um, with, with the class at the UFC for me, and then with the, the seminars that I teach, um, it's, I don't know, I now have, um, have become so comfortable with this leadership uh, teacher role that, because that's where I really resonate with and it's true to me, that I guess I give that vibe off and it's unquestioning for everyone else around me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like it's been many, many years now where, I've been questioned as like, how do I say this? Like a, an authority black belt. I don't know how you say it, but without sounding arrogant, but um, yeah, it's been years since that. And I think it's just because that's how it is. And that's my attitude. Um, kind of a bit like how Emily, you were saying where, where how your, your perspective and your experience of whether it's a male or female is irrelevant. It's um, us, we're leaders and that's it. That's I also it. kind of wanted to touch on the idea of being a good leader as well, because I think when we're talking about somebody being leader, all the qualities associated with that fall on a spectrum, and I don't think everyone will be a good leader for the rest of their lives. They'll have hiccups, and I think what we're really, what we're really looking towards is a present leader, um, somebody that can kind of look within and assess whether they're doing the right things and whether they're really providing a quality substance to their students and, or the people that they're leading. Um, like, because I've really met so many people in my life where I know their intentions are good. I know that they're trying to make the best of a situation, but they're allowing um, many other things to come in the way of them being authentic or them being really present and available for their students. And it's like, it is through no fault of their own that circumstances befall them and bad things happen because they do happen to everyone. And we do need to take time and space to reassess. But I think the, the real marks of a true present leader are somebody that is like actively always looking back on themselves and their personal evolution and seeing whether or not they're developing. Like Emily mentioned before, looking to outside resources to bring in information or knowledge about things that we don't necessarily know about. And also having the gall kind of to set aside the ego for a moment and say, no, I don't know everything. There are people that do things better than I do, whether that's offering emotional support, technical advice, anything like that. Um, and having kind of the self-awareness to say, I don't know everything, I make mistakes, I wanna work on being better, and I wanna work on recruiting more sources of knowledge, more sources of information 
to give to my students and give to the people that I'm trying to lead so that they can be better through me. And it's not just um, all about me. Right, um, just to touch on that though, um, when, when you said it's not just all about you, I think that's really the crux of it. Um, it's about how you care about your students learning, how, how much you care about them. Um, I mean, how many of us have seen instructors who spend their time on their phones? They'll teach something and then they'll start typing text messages to someone um, because they think their job's done. You know, they're not actually emotionally invested in the students. And that, I think, is the most important thing about being a good teacher, a coach and a leader. It's how much you care about the student's journey. I agree with that, Sophia. Um, one thing that we saw today, the article regarding Claudia Duvall, I want to know everyone's perspective on it. I've had people coming to me every hour of every day since that interview got posted um, with like kind of surprise and shock. And I'm not surprised at all. Um, I also want to reframe how we look at people like this, how we look at predators. We have so many predators, abusers, rapists, what have you in jujitsu, in martial arts, in any community where people um, are really vulnerable with one another and um, people in power and to see gaps where they can kind of come in and overpower certain groups and like take control and ruin people's lives. Um, I really want to specifically say that people like that are not monsters, they're human beings. And we need to stop making that distinction right away because I see a lot of people saying, Dale, he was this, Dale, he was that. Don't group him in with the rest. No, no, group him in with the rest. Mm -hmm. Like, we know so many people that are capable of doing what he's done. And we probably know people that have done it, that there's no like evidence that has come out or people have not like spoken out about it yet. We have to be able to look at people that could be our friends, our instructors, our training partners, what have you, and say, yes. This person was capable of doing that. Now what do we do with that information? We have to be able to remove that barrier of like, well, this person means that to me. I have a personal attachment to this person. I have an emotional bond to this person. I'm not gonna acknowledge the fact that they were capable of doing this. I mean to say that yes, they were. Um, and now what do we do moving forward? How do we come together as a community and heal these situations and remove people from these places of power that are committing atrocities and really up, spend more time uplifting the victims instead of questioning them or telling them that you know they should have kept quiet or that they should really reevaluate what their role in the situation was. Mm -hmm. um, I just had to get that out there because too many people I think are trying to take away responsibility where there should be, um, where responsibility should be brought into. Uh, Dominique, I agree with you, but there's one thing I'm gonna sound like I disagree with you on. I don't believe in cancel culture. I think we need to teach people how to evolve. And I agree. The, because, I agree with you. Because yeah, really. I, I think what the problem is, is that this type of behavior has been okay for so long. So the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And when you see an instructor behave like this, chances are a lot of the male students behave the similar way because they think it's acceptable. And in a, for a long time, this was the norm. Like when I was coming up in jujitsu, this is just what happened, you know? And I also want to say that like, sometimes there are some women that want to have their cake and eat it too. And there are some women that go out there and this is a hard thing for men to address and say. And so it comes out, it comes out the wrong way. I think when men try to address this, there are some women that I have personally experienced and seen that go out of their way to draw attention to themselves. And they just don't like the outcome of what happens, you know, the instructor or the whoever it is, doesn't fall for, for their um, ador adoration and they go back to their former girlfriend or whatever. But when there are true victims of abuse and there are true predators out there, this is learned behavior. And part of what we have to do is change the norm. And I think a lot of that happens not only from women choosing to stand up and say what's right and what's wrong and sharing their experiences. You know, one of the challenges about this type of a situation is that so many women have these experiences, but they're afraid to actually say anything. So if they don't say anything and it's just a whisper in the locker room or uh, they tell their five female friends, it's very hard for those of us who might have a larger voice to actually say anything credible because we have it's just kind of hearsay, right? So for Claudia Duvall to go on the record and share this experience, and when you watch the interview, what's heartbreaking is it actually even seems like 
that wasn't going to be part of the discussion and she just felt compelled to say it. And so for anyone that has been uh, commenting that, oh, well, it was just a massage or she should, you know, I'm just like, if you actually watch and pay attention to her behavior, this is not somebody who came on the screen to just accuse people and create drama. This is somebody who was sharing something very intimate about her life. And so I think it's not only um, women being able to support somebody like this, but it's also very much men who stand beside women to make an example of this and to say this is not acceptable in our culture because it doesn't matter how many women congregate and shame or say like this is wrong it shouldn't happen anymore we're just preaching to the choir yeah. and we really need higher profile men male athletes who have a platform to stand up and say that this is wrong because until they make a until they set a better example to follow hundreds of thousands of men will still think that this is the okay thing to do, which is why you get a lot of pushback. And for those people, I just, I can't even engage with them because I'm like, clearly we're not on the same level. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia, what's your ideas about that rape culture in BJ? Oh yeah. I think it's rife. I think it's around a lot more than what women are, um, what women are admitting to. Um, and I kind of wish more women would speak up, but just like what Emily was saying, there's, there is that lot of pushback. It's mm -hmm. tough. I think um, if women are scared to speak up for whatever reason, um, probably the best thing is more women out front, being the, being, um, being the professors so that there's less future occurrence of that happening um, even if even if we can't get the men to change their culture we, uh, change their idea which I think is happening anyway um, the incidence rate would reduce if more women were out teaching the classes and owning the gyms and playing those leadership roles I think and, uh, yeah go ahead I think for me personally like there's a there's a bunch of stuff that's happened to me and I haven't really shared much of it um, in fact I've had like, like horrors um, for the last four or five years of my life. Um, and I just don't feel like I can speak about it. Yet what I'm doing is um, flipping it to be in an empowered position. So, so that I'm, I am in a certain position so that that doesn't happen to other people. Does that make sense? So leading by example and just being out in the front um, so that people who come to me don't experience that. Sure. And I think part of it is calling it out when it does happen. I, I think part of it is that things like this happen and nobody knows what to say. And so it just continues to happen because not saying anything is in some ways, for some people it signals, well, it's appropriate. I can still continue to behave this way. Mm -hmm. So much to what Sophia is saying, I think when you recognize this isn't okay and you actually put a voice to that, somebody gets a slap on the wrist and they go, oh, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm, I'm not, you know, like that's inappropriate. Sophia, I don't know if you would relate to this, but um, I, I work with an adult develop, developmental psychologist on a few work related things. And something we went over that was kind of fascinating to me was looking back at my own history and understanding whether I'm, you know, a victim, a persecutor or a rescuer, because this kind of triangulation occurs. Everybody falls into one box. Yeah. And whether in times of stress, you go fight, fright, uh, fight, flight, or freeze. And so we discussed at length that I always fight and I'm always, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm never a victim. So in every circumstance of stress I've faced in my life, these are the two places I go. I'm always yep. going to fight and I'm never going to be the victim. Yep. So, so looking back at things that have happened to me historically, uh, there was an incident that wasn't jujitsu related where I kind of passed off the incident as like, oh, that was kind of like a strange sexual oddity that happened. <laughs> and going back through this instance, I was actually corrected. And, you know, this person said to me, actually, you were sexually assaulted. But the problem is you don't see yourself as a victim. So because you want to fight yeah. everything, so you'll never admit that this actually happened to you. And I actually have a hard time saying that. Like, I can't even say I was a victim of sexual assault because I'm like, 
no. I mean, like I yeah. tried to handle it the best way that I could. And so I think that, you know, this is a very complex situation and the psychology mm-hmm. behind it makes it difficult for women to say what they need to say. And it makes it very easy for sometimes the naysayers to point fingers and say, well, then it never really happened or you accept right. it and it's okay. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I'm 100% on that page and I uh, understand the psychology behind it. Um, actually kind of a bunch of people in my family are um, psychologists or psychiatrists or whatever. So I'm kind of around it a lot, but um, th- I think I'm the same too. And I've, I've, I'm not a victim in my mind. And um, you know, when the whole me too movement came, came up, you know, I didn't um, contribute. Um, and it's because I, shit's happened to me like a lot, but I didn't actually, um, I didn't feel like a victim during that or after that. I like you go into that fight mode. And um, I actually think that that's a real source of strength because you are taking responsibility. My issue with victim, and I'm probably saying this wrong, so I might offend people, but is being in a state of victimhood basically means that the responsibility is is out away from you. Does that make sense? How how am I? I'm not explaining this very well, but what I'm trying to say is, um, you with this mindset of being a victim is that you can't take responsibility, and it's um, bad things happen to people, right? We've all been through our really horrible bad things, but it's about taking responsibility that, oh, yep, this happened. So how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to workshop through it? How am I going to work on my perspective to like kind of reduce some of the trauma? How am I going to move forward? How am I going to turn this situation into being like something positive for myself in the long run, gives me inner strength, and then for others to be helping them and guiding them? That's kind of what I mean. So people, I think, people, I think, I think you're talking about it from a point of victim, be, calling yourself a victim or being a victim sort of implies passivity. Yes. And I think what you're trying to say is that, you know, how can you empower yourself to think differently about the situation as opposed to just receiving? shit whatever shit that may be but right yeah yeah, i get i get it being proactive about um the horrible situation and turning it into something that could potentially be better um and and that is my issue about uh the victim mentality um is that um it's it sort of implies a, a sense of helplessness in some ways and it's like it doesn't necessarily have to be that way I, I think people have to deal with that in their own time. It doesn't right. create that somebody was raped and there was a rape right. there. And so I, I think we're kind of getting away from that topic and putting it back yeah. on the victim. And we have a tendency to do that in society as well. I Absolutely. Think what yeah. I've been seeing on Facebook around rape culture is guys generally don't take accountability. They look yeah. to blame the victim how could she have avoided this? What did she do? What was she wearing? It doesn't matter what the matter. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so I don't want anyone to misconstrue what I'm saying. I guess what I'm trying to sort of really push is that for anyone that has been violated or, you know, whether it's physically or emotionally, um, it's really hard, obviously. And I'm not taking that experience away. Um, but we can work on ourselves to reclaim our power. That's kind of what I'm saying. Which is why I think what she did was, was incredible. You know, it takes a lot, you know, for someone who in the course of the interview discusses how lonely her path has been and how she was bullied and how she had to overcome so many personal, um, you know, uh, hurdles to, to be where she is for her to be able to share something that deeply intimate about what happened to her I think is such a, sh- that vulnerability is such a sign and signal of strength that I feel, I feel that those of us who can in the jujitsu community amplify the, the cause should, because, you know, this kind of stuff needs to be heard about. And I can't tell you countless times I get sent messages from this person, that person over here, over there. Can you speak out about this? And I'm like, I have nothing on the record. I can't speak about something that's kind of happening everywhere. And for her to do this, was huge. And I'm sure it was um, nerve wracking for her to do as well, because she's, she just put the spotlight on herself and she's probably going to get a lot of hate mail from it. 
you know, yeah. so I think she does support that we can give her. Yeah, absolutely. I gotta say, I was really just disappointed in the male black belt community. There's some big names out there that could have said, you know what, this is wrong. I've not seen a single post. I actually shared that post and most of the people who liked it or gave angry faces were women. And I'm like, where are you men? I don't know if you read the, uh, the post that I put up on Facebook, but I said, if you feel a little bit uncomfortable uh, with what you're reading or what this interview is about, it's probably because you either done it or you've been around it and you've had to play witness to it. And that's male and female, you know? And I think you have to know your audience. Um, I have a lot of men on my page that will come and debate and discuss things. And I'm really proud of all the dudes that have gone on and paid attention to the post and shared it. But I know my audience. And I also know what, what the male black belt school owner audience is. And I, it, it's going to be a rare thing if we see them say something and and this is and that's the problem until they decide to stand up and say this is wrong the behavior will continue it will continue because it means that it's accepted and we'll just continue to look the other way because by not posting and not saying anything about it they're just choosing to turn a blind eye because that's their bro that's their friend they go back to like 20 years they were training partners they can't possibly say negative things because i say in the post as well to speak out against things like this means that you were a part of a falsehood, you know, to say that you adored this man and mm -hmm. to now say this is wrong means that some part of you is wrong, right? Or people think that this is the right. Case. Changes and, that fear of the yeah, truth. You, can't, you people don't want to change their own narrative. That's Therefore, it. they look the other way. And, and yeah. that's, part of, that's part of us taking responsibility for our past. Nobody's perfect. We're all going to do shitty things. I'm sure all of us have done things that we're not proud of. But the difference is when, you, when it comes to crossing that bridge and you know, righting the wrongs and saying, I contributed to this, you should speak up if you can. Yeah. yeah. I also think that there's just uh, a lot of people likely sitting on their hands that are in those positions that are male black belts that see something like this and they think back to their own kind of situations where they've done something that was a little like morally ambiguous. We like know so many, we know so many rumors about so many high level uh, male black belt athletes or instructors that are legends, right? Widely respected, widely renowned that have slept with their students, that have assaulted their students, that have brought in instructors that have assaulted or slept with female students and have done nothing about it or even punished uh, the victims or the female yep. students instead. And we know them and we know this about them and they're here and they're teaching and they're still running their schools and everything is alive and well. And no one comes out and says, this person raped me, this person did this to me, because it's hard because you're seeing kind of what Claudia is going through right now. And yeah. she's already widely respected. She has her own two feet to stand on for earning those medals and working hard and not having any support. And people are still coming for her, even though she has everything to lose. Um, they're trying to find convenient reasons for why this is an untrue story or what her motivations could be um, that are completely besides the point. And that this is a really big story. And these kind of even uh, smaller stories of like a convenient kind of situation that happened between an instructor and a student are swept under the rug continuously. So we know there's gotta be so many, like thousands of cases of this happening around the world. And as Emily was saying, people never wanna be associated with the guy that did this. So a lot of people are not gonna speak out about it because they don't want people to look at them as potential people who did the same thing, or they did that thing in like a smaller scale to somebody a long time ago. And they're afraid that someone will have the courage to step up and say the same thing about them. One of the reasons why I do lifestyle camps is for exactly this. Um, it's there always seems to be a habit that goes on where everyone now understands that there is uh, a safe space and uh, they start to let their guard down. And it, usually by day three in my lifestyle camps, that's when the breakdowns happen. And people are just, they're releasing and they're, they're, they're letting go of their trauma. Um, and it starts by the introduction in my camps by, um, you know, who they are, where they're from, and why they got started in jujitsu. Um, and it's so sad to know 
that probably two thirds of the women who started Jiu Jitsu in the first place started because they wanted to protect themselves because they'd already been violated. That's yeah, what kills okay. me. And that's why I do what I do by, um, and I hope guys listening to this, what I've been saying about the victim thing hasn't been misconstrued. I guess I'm talking more about the mentality because so much of what I'm so passionate about doing for women is to get them out of the place where they feel helpless and get them um, to reclaim their power. And really at the end of the day, the, the camps and jujitsu is just a vehicle for me to help them do that, to understand how powerful they are and that they are supported and connected and they're not so alone because so many of us have actually been through something similar. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We had a couple more questions, but I'll kind of jump ahead a little bit here to, to wrap this up. I know we're going on, but with, with everything that we've kind of gone over and covered, you know, I think that, that, community is so important especially with everything that's going on and I think community plays a huge part for all of us in our jujitsu journey and I wanted to kind of talk about you know we talked about the women that we called their batshit crazy <laughs> that led the way um, but who are some women who kind of inspired you guys that one right there <laughs> <laughs> Her name is Emily Clark, and she's my biggest female inspiration model, and will be for the rest of my life. My drop gun. <laughs> well, we don't know, Dominique. I can do something really bad. <laughs> I'll accept you no matter what you do. Okay, no, I don't. Not anything. Not anything really. But we'll get back. <laughs> hmm. I remember you, um, Emily, competing. Uh, I, I believe I was there, and it was that year that you won the worlds, or. Uh, yeah, I remember. Or yeah. One of these, you won the worlds or whatever. I remember that. I'm like, yeah, she's cool. <laughs> I feel really old. Um, oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm actually somebody who doesn't believe in age. I don't mind getting old, but it's like, it's hard to believe looking back that I've been doing it as long as I have. Um, and for everybody, there was somebody, you know? And I mean, this sounds kind of so funny, but like when I started jujitsu, um, I looked up to this one white belt. There was one white belt woman in class who would uh, be, she was, she was able to pass the guard of the dudes. And looking at her made me feel like, oh man, I can be like that. Then that would be amazing. And she was somebody that I looked up to a great deal, who I think stopped training shortly thereafter. But I looked up to her because she did something that I couldn't do. And that was all that I needed to get started. And when mm -hmm. I started back in like 2000, 2001, there was no social media. You know, you, you just could, you never heard about people. You only knew about pe people were spoken about if their reputation preceded them. So, you know, um, I heard about Lekka. She was probably one of the first women that I had ever heard about. Um, and one year, I, I think as a, as a blue belt, I went down to a competition in Santa Cruz and I remember watching this one woman, I think her name was like Maria Azevedo or something like that. I don't think she competes anymore. And I watched this one match go down and I was just in admiration because they were brown belts or black belts at the time. And I just thought, wow, imagine that if, if I could ever get to that stage. Um, and then as competition became a bigger thing and it was brought to North America, I had the opportunity to meet so many wonderful women and, you know, Hannette Stack, uh, is it was a huge inspiration for me. I feared her a lot in a good way. Like I feared her like, wow, I don't want to ever fight her until <laughs> my ass. And she did. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, to my credit, she, her and her instructor came up to me after and they're like, you never got submitted by her. You only lost by six points. This was amazing. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. But, you know, today it's incredible. There's so many wonderful women that are out there doing things. And, you know, I admire the, the two ladies that you have on here, like I admire seeing Sophia get out there and, and, you know, push the cause for women. Dominica, who I've known since she was a wee little lad before <laughs> she was taller than me. Well, actually, no, she was always taller than me. Yeah, <laughs> a teenager. She was a teenager and I can't believe what she's gone on to accomplish and do herself. And I think for any instructor to look and, and see that somebody that they had a hand in training at some point in time, goes on to uh, achieve the type of things that she's achieved makes me feel like, holy shit, you know, like 
thank God I had my, my, my little piece of, of paying, paying it forward. And I love seeing all the women that are coming up, uh, you know, everywhere. It's amazing. I imagine the landscape has changed a lot from when you started, Emily, to, to where maybe you saw one woman every now and again, but to see how it's exploded. What does that mean to you? I mean, you had a hand in that. I'm just thankful. So I'm trying to learn how to surf, like literally like myself personally <laughs> learning how to surf. And I can't fucking catch a wave to save my life. But I will say that in jujitsu, what started out as a harmless like fitness activity, I cannot believe that I seem to have caught the wave at the right time. And now like I feel like I'm on that wave looking back and going, holy shit, look at all the women that are in the lineup now. Like they weren't here five years ago, you know, and it's amazing. It's amazing. And I want it to be a more like, this should be a regular thing. You know, it's nice to be able to have conversations and to have peers like the women here. Um, it's, it's lovely to be able to see women. you know, we started doing our camps 10 years ago. How many of the women that have come through our camps? Dominica was the same. She came as a teenager. They're now coming back as instructors or they've gone and done their own thing or they're running their own programs it's so cool to see how the, 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 so the seeds that you sowed way back then are, are starting to reap out in really amazing ways. So it's, it's funny it's, that you use so cool. the analogy of surfing because <laughs> I think of girls and geese. Well, I'm one, I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and two, I always thought of it as, you know, you guys were the vessel. Groundswell Grappling was the original camp. You know, Ashley, our founder, she was inspired yes. by coming to your camps to start Girls and Geese. And I always thought of being Girls and Geese and being out there with you and Groundswell and the sweaty Bettys. We were these lone surfers sitting in this flat, flat, flat ocean going, the swells are coming, you guys, we promise. <laughs> The swells are coming. You just have to wait. They're going to come. And now those swells are rolling in. So it's, yeah. it's funny that you use that analogy. That's well, it's, it's crazy. We didn't do a camp for a few years because everybody was kind of go, going through some personal issues. But if this camp ever happens because of this fucking outbreak, um, <laughs> Dominica, myself, Hanette, and J Jazari were supposed to have a camp next weekend. Um, it's been pushed to July and hopefully it happens, but the camp sold out in five minutes. And wow. that was, I mean, to see that, and, and I get emails all the time of people that are still like, if somebody cancels, I'd like to still come. I mean, it's, it's incredible to see the demand and, you know, you guys have gone out there and put a lot of, uh, women on the map with assembling huge amounts of ladies all over the country. And it's just, it's, it's really great to see that women are feeling like this space is a place that, that they belong in now. Um, yeah, they're not afraid to show up. And I know we kind of touched on, I, I just, I, I, again, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know we kind of touched on the important, you know, talking about women training with each other. And you mentioned that you don't have women's classes, but as far as the community goes and the support, do you think that sisterhood uh, is something that's important to you and your journey and is something that, you know, we should teach this new generation the importance of that? For me, for sure. It's like one of the hashtags I use too. It's everything, actually. Yeah, I would, I would say the same. Uh, not to go on too deep of a tangent of my love for Emily. <laughs> um, I didn't but, pay uh, her. I didn't pay her. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she's paying me on the low. She's not telling the truth, you guys. Um, I, I grew up like not really having women to train with and having like a real handful of uh, women to choose from that were high level competitors, one of which was Emily. And to finally kind of stumble upon her as an instructor and like have her guidance made all the difference to me because I felt like I was cast aside so much as a female student, um, either because people only assumed that I could be there. I, I could potentially be someone's like romantic partner I would potentially decide to get married and have a kid and drop off the scene, or I would potentially move on from my life and like leave jujitsu to the boys. And here was somebody who was very active um, and voicing this idea of making or bringing your own key to the table and, and demanding to be kind of listened to and demanding to be um, a part of this whole thing. And I was like, really, if she can do it, then for sure I can do it. And so naturally I feel like I've been like, 
following in her footsteps a little bit, like trying to carve out my own piece of the jujitsu empire because she made it possible for someone like me to do that through the work and through the kind of endurance of all the, the bullshit that came with having like this kind of jujitsu history. Beautiful. I, um, I think that for people watching this um, podcast, what I think will be very refreshing for everyone to hear is that we have all had these experiences of going through hardcore bullshit, of being pushed aside, of not being taken seriously, or or being someone's love interest or one of the dudes, like one or the other, you know what I mean? Um, and so I think that that's really helpful for everyone listening in to know um, that we've all experienced that. Um, and yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of t together we're stronger Absolutely. And, I, and I also I say to all my beginners you know sometimes if you look at the women on this call I'm sure they get it all the time when a new student walks in and they go man I, I wish I could be something like you or you're amazing like I uh, one day I hope that I'll, I'll do you justice and I always tell new students that I'm no different from them you know, and I don't need to be called professor or master or anything because the only difference between me and them was that I started doing this long before they did. But <laughs> that is I, so funny. Right? Like exactly I, what I suffered I just as much as they will. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just on the other side of it. I just know what that suffering is. And yeah. so, um, you know, but for me, that's a message for male, males and females, you know, for anybody really is, is that we've just hung in there you yeah. know, and we've made the landscape maybe a little bit easier for them to walk on now, but yeah. it's, it's the same landscape. Absolutely. Yeah, well put. And I, I want to leave with this final thought. Do you think that as women in this sport, in this art, in this community, that we can achieve equality? <sighs> it's a very <laughs> large question, Shamalan. <laughs> <laughs> minutes <laughs> I, think uh, I do, do. Always... go ahead go ahead i do but the entire um thought thought pattern and structure behind society needs to change as well so jujitsu itself as the sport can't really become completely equal or quality unless everything across the scene changes because it's a different way of thinking full stop i think um speaking about equality is in parallel terms to speaking about world peace we can kind of get close to bridging that gap but then something will happen to kind of destabilize in one direction or the other i think for a fact we're always progressing as a society that's undisputable and we're always moving forward that's kind of the condition of being human is to find progress and evolve so i think that that gap will close over time but i'm not sure that true equality or like mathematically or logically or from a utilitarian sense like real equality of us having like equal resources equal opportunities equal respect equal rights i'm not sure that that's uh i'm not sure that that's available because of how nuanced the human condition is uh, I'm just gonna say, it's just, yeah the whole mindset really, does it even really fucking matter i yeah. mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Really, our, I mean, we've spoken this entire call about having made our reality our reality. Mm -hmm. Does it really fucking matter what the rest of the world thinks? Because you will grow and you will guide the people that opt in to your culture. And if I'm not a living example of it, then these ladies certainly are. There are plenty of people out there that believe that our way is a great way and a right way and a different way. And so I speak to those people and I could give a shit about the people that can't figure it out. Not everyone is going to be evolved on the same level. You know, like we can't, we can't force people to grow and change. It's just not something we can do. So why waste our time doing that? And why not be, you know, uh, attend to and put more attention towards people that believe in our cause? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. We've covered a lot of ground today. <laughs> We've dug deep. Um, yeah, I can't, I, I've had the honor of, of getting to know you guys, traveling all over the place. All three of you inspire me so deeply. I've had amazing conversations with all of you and 
you know, it was such a pleasure to have you guys on our very first podcast. And I look forward to bringing you guys back because there's a lot of topics I think we could cover ground on and get some really good dialogue going. And um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inspiring me. Thank you for inspiring you. other women and, and your students and everybody in the community. Women are badasses. And uh, <laughs> you are, you are too. badass and batshit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Combination. It's a good combination. <laughs> you get an interview with just that, honestly. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, ladies. And um, again, thank you for being on this show. And thank you, thank you all for supporting the movement and getting, you know, and being a part of Girls and Bees. That means the world to me as well.